take all this out of here, says the Lord, as he reclaims the house of God for God his Father, and in so doing reminds us to do the same. One time I was taking a very pious young guest to a nearby monastery, Monte Oliveto, in Italy, and her comment was, trop de choses, too many things. There were too many things in the church. The Cistercian reaction was one of verticality purity of lines, the Gothic point zooming upwards and cracking through the clouds into glory. The eye was to be carried upwards with not too many things to take its attention on the way. And it led to emptiness in which the human voice resounded empty medieval churches. And that was the inheritance that was ours at St. Antimo, a beautiful medieval church full of powerful acoustic. We never used the organ to accompany the voice, only sometimes for other bits. And therefore with the young voices we reproduced the sound of the ages and the stones recognised it. One young Frenchman who came on retreat made this comment, it is the place on earth where the new rite is celebrated best of all. We have maintained the maximum of the old, facing east, using incense every day and everything entirely in Latin. And the continuity was there, that hermeneutic of continuity of which Pope Benedict spoke. It worked. And if it's not broken, why fix it? Everyone was touched. One time I was keeping the little place at the back of the church where the guardian would sit, and a lady came in and I heard her whispering, "Es stupenda. It is stupendous. I remember being told in a letter James Hogg wanted me to visit it when I was still in Ireland. The church is a wonder, and it was one of the gems of Italy. That was our heritage, granted us freely, gratuitously, by the local bishop, who first of all had made an appeal to the Benedictines of Fongombo. They couldn't take it but proposed it to our founding prior. And so it happened and the bishop did the rest. It could have remained that way, but then this other thing came in, Auferte ista hinc, take these things out of here. Not bodily things, physical things, material things in church, no, but taking on too many things. First of all, building a massive structure actually out of sight, it's supposed to be underground on the mountain opposite for the scouts. Then taking on huge parish work, massive activities going on, courses, music, all the rest of it. And the result was the illness of activism. And when that happens, the interior life can suffer, community life can suffer, tension comes in and the brethren may not have the same quality time for each other. Their mind is elsewhere. It didn't work. I remember trying to warn the brethren that it was not going to work, and the prior did the same, the founding prior. But on it went. The youth and the energy of the community were such that they kept on taking on more things. But the blessing was lost in dispersion, and now the community has gone from there, 
and probably will have to close up elsewhere as well. It needn't have happened, but let it be a lesson that it is better to have a few things done well than to be too thinly spread, the catastrophe of many a community. The church itself that we had inherited was one of the gems. All the stones at the sanctuary end were precious. If you shone a torch, the light would shine through. Onyx, it lets the light pass. It was a joy to celebrate at the high altar, the same high altar, and surrounded by incense and chant to pierce the skies, facing the miraculous crucifix, which had not wanted to go away, when earlier times had wanted to put it in a museum. When it was taken from there, the ground began to rock, earthquake after earthquake, only in that area between there and the museum. And we have on record that it was restored and then the earthquakes ceased. There it was before us as we celebrated. Christ sleeping in majesty, having conquered death, king of all the ages, reclaiming that bit of earth for himself, for a church is extraterritorial and belongs not to the earth. And therefore the mode of operation does not belong to the earth either. And we were formed by the good prior to be completely silent in church and to think only of God therein. On this feast of the dedication of the Atrium Basilica, we think of this, of these beautiful buildings that we have received, but also as we listen to the homily of St. Caesar of Arles, at vigils, we are reminded that we are, in the first place, the temple of God. And therefore peace must reign inside and that same absence of clutter. For we too destroy our inner sanctum with too many things. Things the Lord of hosts never asked to take us on, take on Lord. I just conclude with this word which, observing how these people came into church and were struck by the beauty. It was something which I had to appreciate and honour God well with. I remember not long before then, I had been with Eddie Stones who has great gifts and he had seen a great black cross over me. It was, what was not working in Ireland, obviously it was not going to work. And then he saw in a second time the door of a church opening and it was this one. It was St. Antimo which was going to be a haven of rest. It was something which heaven sent and where grace would flow. Ordination would come and people by the hundred would be cured and healed in their soul. Nature also helped. So I wrote this while reminding myself how I need to be also a little temple free from noise and clutter. It was written on this very feast. To build upon the earth a vault of heaven that will with glory beam to hold a ray of God in stone, well hewn and deftly given, a light to tame, the ancient light to flay in poor and prismic chiselling. There to store the travelling wave that left the Elysian home of soft taboric ether, where before the light of light 
the seraph's eye did roam. To come again, to come again, again, at the clap of yester sound, to crystal wall, Jerusalem the blessed, till tired stars wane. And there, upon the deep of night to call. This is to trap a glister in its flight. To tune into a range of strange dark.